Hey, I'm Christoph Simpson, a member and one of the current leaders of LANS. So starting now, we'll try to do a sort of recap of each week at the beginning of the following week. So today, we're doing a recap of the past week based on perspectives of persons in the membership and leadership of LANS. So starting on sexual harassment, um, we're going to be talking about frivolous claims, landlords demanding sex, and landlords using cameras. Now, sexual harassment is being discussed a lot, um, separate from the common discourse on catcalling and just what women go through generally in navigating Jamaica. Um, there is a sexual harassment bill that a committee of parliament is debating, and they invite persons who are not members of parliament to come to parliament and to share their like proposals and ideas and so on, and perspectives. So we, as lands, actually went to parliament and made a presentation in January, and the presentation process stalled, and because the government said that they didn't get enough submissions from the public, so they invited the public to make more submissions and extended the deadline and more groups did make submissions and because of the pandemic they weren't holding the meetings for a while but they have resumed now and more entities and institutions have been bringing things up and discussing things with the committee so one of the things that was brought up was frivolous claims lately now apparently there's a section in the sexual harassment bill which basically says that you can be fined like up to a million dollars if a tribunal that is looking at whether you're sexually harassed or not uh, agrees that you were making a frivolous claim. And this is pretty, pretty ridiculous because that is something very subjective. And then you're giving this committee that power to just say, OK, yeah, um, we don't think your claim of sexual harassment was serious and we are going to slap you with a fine of a million dollars. You're giving them that power. So this is not a partisan issue because while one member of the JLP, Delroy Chuck, was sort of defending this part of the legislation, it was other members of the JLP who were arguing against this. Um, and I'm sure some persons from PNP were as well. When we made a submission in January, um, when Delroy Chuck was coming at us, persons from both the JLP and PNP were siding with us. So, yeah, this idea of frivolous claims, we had brought it up in our proposal as well. And we actually want to remove this idea from the bill in general. This idea of, okay, without any investigation, you can dismiss a case because you think it's uh, a frivolous claim. That in itself is a problem. And if you hear a case, and at the end of it, you determine that it's frivolous, you can dismiss it as well. So, yeah, this would discourage a lot of women from coming forward um not only because they think they might not be successful in seeking some sort of justice but also because you're now actively discouraging them you're letting them know that there's a possibility that they can be punished for coming forward and i know i specify women um the bill and or laws around sex are very gender specific but that is also something we addressed we called for the sexual harassment bill to be gender neutral, in um, especially when it refers to sex because of how pedantic our law is about sex. Um, as in about what sex is and that it's man, woman. So like same sex sexual harassment, it's unclear whether it would address that. But we, we made a submission on getting into all of that. And also just in general, women tend to be more harassed in, in the workplace than men. Um, so yeah, that's the frivolous claims. Um, another thing now, moving a little away from the general thing, because this is not only about workers, it's also about tenants. So it's not only about the employee-employer relationship. It's about tenants and landlords as well. And there are other relationships as well. So you have landlords demanding sex as a way to pay rent. There was a case where a landlord demanded sex and still took the person to court for not paying rent. Now, they should not have even accepted sex as payment. They should not have demanded, I should say, um, sex as payment in the first place. Um, that is coercion. You're taking advantage of somebody in a vulnerable situation, um, which means their consent isn't real. And even if the sex didn't happen, you approaching them 
to sort of initiate that is harassment, especially with the, the power dynamics surrounding it. So the thing is, the sexual harassment bill already takes that position, but this is showing the urgency of pushing the bill to get it passed, why we actually need a sexual harassment bill. Of course, we need to discuss it thoroughly first, but this is why we need a sexual harassment bill. And at the end of the day, the sexual harassment bill isn't even going to be some sort of criminal law. If it's passed, you being found, if, if it is confirmed that yes, if a tribunal says yes, you are guilty of sexual harassing somebody, it's not going on some criminal record because it's not a criminal law. And it's not even being handled by the courts. It's being handled by a tribunal that falls under a ministry. So think about that. And then think about how limited this is in allowing persons to get justice in the first place and how they're still discouraging persons from seeking those um, ways of redress. So another thing that came up was landlords using cameras. Now, landlords are installing cameras when they're supposed to be fixing lights and things like that. They install cameras to spy on the tenants. And when I say cameras, I don't mean they put a camera in a driveway or at the front door. I mean, they put cameras in person's private spaces. And that is a like, serious violation of person's privacy. That is something that we should like be looking into. Why is this happening? Um, they're saying that when they update the Cyber Crimes Act, they will address something like this. And there are other things that we brought up in our discussion on the sexual harassment bill that they said they could address within the Cyber Crimes Act. Now, yes, this goes much further than sexual harassment, and this itself definitely should be a crime. But this is just, again, to show the seriousness of why we need a sexual harassment bill and the seriousness of the different relationships that it examines. Now, speaking of relationships, a member of parliament from central Manchester, Rhoda Crawford, she was saying that they need to expand the idea of what they have as institutions. So they specify workplaces and they specify tenant and landlord relationships and they specify places like hospitals and the dynamic between staff and patients. But she's saying they also need to cover churches. So in our submission, we didn't talk about churches, but we also had a broader scope in mind for the type of institutions and the type of relationships that we looked at where sexual harassment could happen. So, for example, the bill in its current stage mentions hospitals and the relation between staff and patient. So protecting patients from sexual harassment by staff who are supposed to care for the patients. But it doesn't protect relatives of the patient who may visit the patient. So if, let's say, an elderly person has a young relative who has to visit them in the hospital and somebody's supposed to go and harass this relative, the bill doesn't say anything about that because the sexual harassment that is protected is the, if it's sexual harassment towards the patient, but not any relative of the patient who may visit, who can also be sexually harassed, by the way. So a lot of control environments exist a lot of environments where sexual harassment can happen and there can be some sort of accountability where the the bill still doesn't apply because there is this philosophy among certain persons in our parliament who they how do I explain? They think it is too much and too difficult to cover and too difficult to regulate because we can't control every single instance every single instance and it shows that they're not really serious about addressing this, some of them. Not saying all of them, and again, it's not a partisan issue. So in singling out a particular politician from a particular party, we're not saying that party on a whole holds that view because some persons from that party have agreed with us. For example, when we're speaking just in general um, on the possibility of even customers harassing staff, Kavan Gale, who is a trade unionist, who is affiliated with the JLP because the BITU is affiliated with JLP and that's the union he's in. Um, and he's appointed to the Senate by the JLP. Um, not sure if he's a senator now, but he was when we were discussing the bill because remember there was an election, but yes. Um, Kavan Gale from the JLP defended us and our argument even though we were in contention with Delroy Chuck. 
and he was helping to to show Delroy Truck what we were saying and why. And also um, to Babsy Grange. No, she is in charge of the committee. This is not, we weren't in any contention with her. But yeah, he was showing it from a worker's perspective. And there are just a lot of things that the bill left out that Delroy Truck and certain others think they're too hard to regulate. So that's it for the sexual harassment bill. Just some general updates on the development, like the, the, the discussion of where that discourse is going, and then also how it relates to things that lands, things that we have discussed within lands already, and things we've established positions on. And when I say we, if you even look at our document, you'll see three or four names, which are the persons that did the main work in the writing of the submission, but the submission was based on the contributions of dozens of persons who attended our meetings, spoke a lot within our meetings, but weren't necessarily a part of the actual formal documentation process. But in our meeting reports, their names are mentioned, and they did make real meaningful contributions to that discussion. It's just some of us have more time, and some of us have specific tasks to do the actual work of the formalization. Um, the next issue that we can talk about is the environment. So we know of the interest in mining. Mining is a very like environmentally destructive thing. And yes, extraction is necessary for getting certain resources, but when not managed well, it really leaves us vulnerable. Now, in Coppet country from a good while now, there has been a lot of interest in mining around that area because there's like bauxite rich land there. And there's this whole debate about whether mining is being allowed in or near the cockpit country. And there is this whole debate about what are the exact boundaries of the cockpit country. So there's this whole debate about whether the mining that's proposed to take place and mining that's already taking place is happening within those specific boundaries. And with the debate on whether the bound with the debate on where the boundaries are, you see where things go there. So e the thing is, even if persons mine adjacent to the cockpit country, it would still have devastating effects on the cockpit country. And over the past few years, if you paid attention to the news and some rural communities as they've complained, you'll see a lot of people have complained about bauxite mining in general. It makes it very difficult to live in certain communities. So a lot of people get displaced. Uh, a lot of people don't have good air quality. A lot of them just can't live peacefully in their homes in general. Uh, separate from the air getting polluted, the water gets polluted. Um, farmers, they, they have to like just go out of business and then their, their crops, their fields get destroyed. So I don't mean they mine on the fields that the farmers have. Obviously, where they mine, they get some permission to mine there already. But the areas surrounding, even somewhat distant from where you have the mines, are affected because, again, it pollutes the air. So that's something we have to think about with mining. And beyond the cockpit country thing, we have a new mining issue. Not bauxite now, but limestone, which comes with its own problems. So there's a particular company that wants to do some mining at the Dry Harbor Mountains near Puerto Bernabe. And Nepo gave a list of reasons for why that should be prevented. Um, they gave a list of reasons for why that's an environmentally sensitive area and why it is unwise to do any sort of mining or quarrying there. Now, one of the reasons was that this is a watershed area, and watershed areas are where like clean water gathers and collects, or where water finds its way like to drain from the land. Now, that will affect two things. It can affect one or both of these two things. One is just the general filtration of groundwater through the earth. So a lot of people feel comfortable drinking from rivers. Why? Because r rivers are largely clean. Now, when you do things that pollute this water, you're damaging our freshwater resources. And the UN had predicted that by 2030, roughly 50% of the world, in terms of population, would be having issues with water shortages. And Jamaica has been having issues with water shortages in recent years. So it's not something to really play around with. And another thing is flooding. With the flooding we've seen this year, 
we can't really be playing around with something that has to do with the drainage direction and patterns and roots of water. Roots as in R O U T E S. So the the paths that they take, we we can't really be playing with that. So it's not really wise to be going and doing this mining or acquiring thing against Nepo's advice. Another thing is these are like this this is highland close to the coast. This is hill close to the coast. And like highland, like hills and mountains close to the coast help to break um wind. So when we get in hit by hurricanes, these are the things that help to like, you know, weaken a hurricane. So when a hurricane has to pass over a good bit of land or has to pass over a good bit of mountainous land especially, it usually gets weakened. So that's something else that we're playing with right there by damaging that. That is a sort of barrier. Um, well, it's not a barrier. It doesn't block the hurricanes. But it, it, these things help to be obstacles for the hurricanes. So yeah, this is not something we want to really play with. And added to that, um, persons have been talking about biodiversity. Um, I'm not sure if there is any particular species of plant or animal there that is endangered, but biodiversity is still important. Um, there are lots of reasons why biodiversity is important. If you've been paying attention to the COVID-19 crisis, I mean, who hasn't though? But yeah, if you've been paying attention to some of the news, that's what I meant, some of the specific news about the crisis, in Denmark, they've had to kill a lot of animals that they call minks. Minks are these rodents that they basically have on large farms, and uh, they use them for fur. Um, the thing is, there's so many of them in such like concentrated populations that the coronavirus was able to be transmitted to them from humans and then back to humans from them. Same with livestock in China and the US. And I'm not talking about talking about, oh, Chinese people are eating bats. What I mean is like actual livestock, like actual pigs. Um, there have been concerns at meat places that the virus is going to animals and then being transmitted back to us. Not with corona in particular in China, but with swine flu in the past. Now, biodiversity makes it harder for diseases to just spread and travel. If two entities are more similar to each other, it's more likely a disease will like pass between them. Uh, a disease isn't going to easily pass between a human and a dog. But if you have a lot of humans coming in contact with a lot of dogs frequently and you have a high, if you have a concentrated population of humans, you're going to have the virus being able to spread between humans. And if you have a concentrated population of dogs, you're going to have it being able to spread among dogs more easily. So it strengthens in one of those populations and it can get transmitted to the other if some mutation or so develops. No, I'm not a bio expert, but what we know is when you have these concentrations of animals, diseases spread easier. and it's harder for diseases to just spread across different species. That is the main point I'm making. So you don't want to play with biodiversity in general. So yeah, that's it for the environment, just some things to think about. Now, the next thing to really think about is just democracy and holding government accountable in general. Now, a lot of persons think because of the parliamentary system that we've inherited, that it's the opposition's job to hold the government accountable. And, oh, well, if you have a problem with the way this government behaves, you should have voted more for the other party to make them in power instead. That is really silly. Um, first of all, if we accept that the government is the majority and the opposition is a minority, the opposition, first of all, doesn't have the legitimacy to be a popular check on power. It doesn't have the legitimacy to be the representative of the people against the government. As in, if a majority of people are opposed to something government is doing, the opposition representing a minority of the people doesn't really represent that majority. The government is the government because it represents the majority, right? And secondly, within the parliamentary system itself, because the opposition represents a minority, they occupy a minority of the seats in both houses. And what does that mean? They don't have the power, really, to stop the government most of the time. So we can't rely on the opposition 
to be the voice of the people. The opposition can't be the voice of the people. It was the party that was defeated in an election. And this is just in general, in principle, this is not about the JLP and PNP specifically. So the government, at the end of the day, has to be accountable to the people. The representatives of both parties need to be accountable to their own supporters. So persons who supported the JLP right now, especially persons who care about the environment, need to engage their party and let them know, okay, we don't like this decision. And that's not coming from a place of being against the party or being against the leadership in general. It's coming from a place of you support the party, you support the government, but you disagree with this decision and you don't feel like it's representing you. That is your duty. And that is how democracy is supposed to function. The will and the consensus of the people is supposed to determine how things go, largely. So... If you are affiliated with the JLP, you should be holding them accountable in this moment. If you disagree with some of the decisions that they're making, or if you fear that they will make certain decisions that you anticipate you will have a problem with. And you can do it in a more genuine way than a political force that's competing with the government. Because the thing is, if the opposition does it, some persons will turn it, I will even say most persons will turn it, into a partisan issue, a PNP and JLP issue. And this is not a PNP and JLP issue. It should not be seen as genuine criticism as the government is something partisan and, oh, you're a PNP if you're criticizing JLP on this. We don't want to move back to that type of politics. Right now, if you're a supporter of the JLP, whether or not you're a supporter of of the JLP. But yes, especially if you are a supporter of the JLP, you should be engaging your party and letting them know you disagree with this. That's if you disagree with it. If you're a member of the PNP, engage your party and let them know what stances you want the PNP to take on this issue and to be more vocal and strong about it. There have been instances in the past where the PNP hasn't been a strong opposition to certain things that the JLP has done. So it is still necessary for supporters of the PNP who are a little more you know firm about certain things than the party has been to pressure the pnp to be firm um we can trust that they will be firm on some things but it extra pressure is always good we need to stop sitting and waiting for our politicians to do things we need to pressure them to do things and when they don't act in our interests we need to find ways to get them to understand the importance of acting in our interests so this is just a general recap of recent issues and just some commentary on democracy and representation. Uh, the topic of democracy and representation came up a lot around election times because pre people were talking about whether voting should be mandatory, and people were talking about what democracy means in general, and the importance of elections and whatnot. And that's something we need to have a discussion about one day. But this is, this is influenced by that. It's not entirely about that. And it's connected to a current pressing issue, with it, which is the environment. Now, moving on to the last thing, just a recap of current affairs within LANS. So, as I said much earlier, LANS recently celebrated our fourth anniversary. So, we elected a seven-member general board and a three-member collective leadership. And we're now in the process of appointing an executive. So, the general board that we elected, they have the power to appoint the executive. So, they're going to point the persons responsible for different things within LANS. So, um, or communications and PR, um, the, the first secretary or general secretary, um, and all the positions like policy, um, policy coordination. So when we do work where we write up policy positions or policy proposals, there is a specific person in our executive that manages that. So we're appointing, we're moving, we're going to that process now where the general board that we have is appointing those persons. So yeah, our election was held in the same week as our fourth anniversary, which was November 11th. And moving forward, this is one of the things that we wanted to do um, to start engaging the public more because we, we met in our separate groups first and then we had a sort of video conference among representatives from the different groups within lands, as well as some guests from other movements and bodies. So our priority now is like getting back on track with addressing these issues. 
So especially the ones that we've addressed before, like the sexual harassment and workers' rights. But we also want to look at the environment issue and we want to lend support to groups that find ways of effectively pressuring the government to step back from certain things. So whatever it will take, um, we are here and willing to engage persons who are concerned about this. We have some projects on the table, so you'll be hearing more from us on those in the future. So I uh, hope you appreciated this recap and follow up with us to see us releasing more content like this. So again, I'm Christoph Simpson. I'm a member and one of the leaders of LANS. And thanks for taking your time to listen to this.